Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see everyone here this morning, and especially Uncle Cass, who was admitted twice to the hospital because of COVID, who happens to be worshiping with us here today. Let's give God a round of applause <coughs> for healing, healing. Amen and amen. Thank you, by the way, for bringing the good weather. I appreciate it. I didn't have to go into my car or put, out, put on my coat today because it's going to be 60 degrees. So thank you, those of you who brought the nice weather. I appreciate that. So we're starting a new series. What's it called? It's on the screen. Galatians Gospel Freedom. What we want to do this, this, uh, in this series, we're starting it today, and we're going to go for three months. We want to discover what is the gospel, number one, and how does it set us free? Okay, what is the gospel? How does it set us free? Let me give you some history to kind of paint the picture of where we're going for the next three months. In fact, we are going to cover the entire book of Galatians. Have you ever read through Galatians before? We're going to go passage by passage for three months through the entire book of Galatians, and we're going to start with the first five verses today. But let me give you some history. Many scholars believe that the book of Galatians, the, the letter of Galatians, was the first letter that Paul the Apostle wrote. It is in this letter that we get the essence of the gospel, the essence of why you and I call ourselves Christians. We are going to discover the heart of Christianity. How many of you have heard of the name Martin Luther before? We're not talking about Martin Luther King Jr. That's a good name. We back up uh, five, six hundred years to Martin Luther, the great reformer. And he said this about the book we're going to study for three months. He said this. Uh, while he was teaching in seminary and teaching, teaching the Bible, he would go to the Galatians. This was his favorite book. He said, the epistle to the Galatians is my epistle. The, 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 the letter to the Galatians is my letter, he said. He said, to it I am, as it were, in wedlock. It is my Catherine. His wife's name was Catherine. I found that interesting because my wife's name is Catherine too, with a K. He said, Galatians is my Catherine. I like that. What was it in this book of Galatians that was so pff, explosive to Paul and explosive to Martin Luther? Why was the book of Galatians to Martin Luther his Catherine? Because it is a book that best illumined the central pillar of Christianity, which is justification by faith, which we will spell out today. What is this theological term called justification by faith? It is Namely, the salvation of sinners by Christ's merits alone. Galatians was so transformative. I would even say that if it wasn't for this book and Romans, there would be no Protestant Reformation. Pastor, what are you talking about, the Protestant Reformation? 1517, Martin Luther, this Catholic monk, was tired of climbing up on his knees, trying to uh, appease this angry God so that he could be forgiven by sin. And then he found, some, he found this special truth in this book in Galatians. And he didn't like what the church was teaching, and so he wrote these 95 theses, these 95 statements that defied the false teaching of the church during that day, and he put them on the doors at Wittenberg. And that sparked the Protestant Reformation, which split Christianity into two main groups. Christianity was, was mainly Catholicism, but after Martin Luther and the rest of the reformers, Christianity became Catholicism and Protestant. They were protesting against something that the Roman church was teaching. All right, that's a lot of history. And you don't think history is relevant? Trust me, you, it, it is relevant, and I promise you that if you if you and I dig into the, this, this, Galatians, this book of Galatians, we are going to experience an explosion of power and truth. So in this morning's teaching, we're only going to discover five verses, the first five verses. And we're going to discover how the gospel changes us. And we're going to look at five verses. We're going to find three explosive words when I think of explosion, I think of fireworks. You know, July 4th. We're going to just look at three explosive words and answer one question. Five verses, 
three explosive, explosive words answer one question. What do we bring to be accepted by God? A couple of years ago, I had the privilege of traveling to Bali. Anyone been to Bali, Indonesia? I love mountains. I really love the beach. I am craving a beach. So if anyone can bring one here, you'll be my best friend. We went to Bali, and I noticed as we would go from town to town, uh, store to store, they would have these gods in front of the stores, in front of the homes. And what I realized was that the, so Indonesia is like 90% Muslim, but in Bali, in Balinese culture, it's very Hindu. And so the Hindus bring food to, to feed and to appease their gods. And I wonder, could it be that in our Christian experience, we might do the same thing? So here's what I want to answer. What do we bring to be accepted, to be saved, to be loved by God? That's what we're going to try to answer. Let's pray. Father, we're going to look at five verses. We're going to explore three explosive words, and we want to answer to answer the question, what do we bring to be accepted by you? Teach us from your word. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Galatians. If you have a physical Bible, digital Bible, that's cool. Let's go right to this letter. Galatians is the ninth book of the New Testament. Many, many, say, many scholars say that this is the first book, first letter that, that Paul wrote. Here we go. Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Paul, there he is, he puts his name right there. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Come on, Paul, why are you starting this letter like this? You're going to find out quickly as we go into this, this series that this, this letter isn't just like a, some, some like normal love letter that you write to your, your special friend or your, your spouse. This is a defensive letter, and he's trying to defend something. He's trying to, to share that the message that came from me doesn't come from men. It didn't even come from my education. It came directly from Jesus Christ. I saw him, and he called me not just to be, you know, the word apostle means uh, someone who was sent, a messenger. And he's saying, uh, I am an apostle, but I'm on a capital A apostle. I belong to a special group that God God called and, and he actually spoke to me to share a special message. Verse two, here we go. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. All right, so why is he saying to all the brethren who are with me? He's saying to the to these churches, not just one church in Galatia, but to, to a, a, a several churches that what, the message that I bring to you comes directly from Christ and it's confirmed by other people, the community of faith. And that's why I, I say, friends, uh, it's, it's always safer to check your beliefs and your interpretations and your ideas of scripture with the community of believers. So he says like, look, um, I got my message from Christ. Uh, it's checked out and, and uh, there's some quality control with my brethren. And I'm writing a special letter, letter to all of you in Galatia. Now, verse three, here we go. You ready for explosive word number one? Three. What's that first word? Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Explosive word number one. I'm going to put it right here on my, I just call it a blackboard. It's just really a black screen. Here we go. Number one. Grace. Explosive word number one. Grace. So what do we know about this word? Let's look at the historical context. When Paul uses this word grace, he's using the greeting of uh, Greco-Roman letters during that time. That's how the people, when they wrote letters to people, their friends, associates, the lovers, grace and peace, grace and peace. He's using a salutation. So uh, they would say, grace to you and peace. What do we use when we write letters? Do we even write letters? Do you guys write letters or just write emails and text messages? When you write a letter, what do you usually, what do you usually put uh, as a salutation? Dear, dear spouse, or dear teacher, or uh, even someone you don't even know. Dear Sally, I just met you last week. We still use dear, right? We, it's a salutation. Our salutation, dear. Their salutation, grace to you and peace. Okay? So that's the first, first uh, way to understand why Paul is using grace. What else is going? Why is... What's going on here? Why is Paul 
using the word grace. You know why? He is defending the gospel against some opponents. We will call these opponents Judaizers. Can you say that with me? Judaizers. Good. Very good. Judaizers were characterized by a few words. Legalism, precision, exactness. And here was their core teaching. If you want to be a true believer, you must strictly observe circumcision and you must strictly observe the law to the T. And they would say, only those who are circumcised, only those who follow the Torah and follow the law perfectly and with precision will receive the promises of Abraham. By the way, these Judaizers were dangerous. They called themselves Christians. So they were saying, we are Christians. In fact, they were semi-Christians. We are Christians, and you must, you must uh, be all about precision and exactness. And they were steering the new believers away from the gospel. So Paul writes this letter to combat their false teaching. He comes to the scene, and he introduces this explosive word. And what's that word, friends? Grace. Not legalism, not precision, not exactness. Grace. Not my perfection, not my obedience. What word did he start with? In his letter, grace. And notice in Galatians, he says grace and peace. In the next letter, Ephesians, grace and peace. In most of his letters, Paul starts with this word, grace. So what is grace anyway? Pastor, help me understand. I will. Thank you for asking. There's two ways to understand grace. Number one. Here's a technical definition. You guys ready? A beneficent disposition towards someone. All right? So it's, it's, it's love towards someone. You're still confused. Let me help, help understand this, help you understand this. Grace comes from the Old Testament words grace, chen in the Hebrew, and steadfast love, chesed. Can you say chesed with me? <laughs> chesed. Okay, you almost have to spit when you say that, right? Good thing you're wearing masks. Chesed. What does that mean? It denotes, it denotes God's loyal love. It denotes God's grace and mercy to forgive his people from sin. Thus, grace is the free, the unmerited love of God. Oh, I love that. Here's an example. Yesterday, my youngest one, Emily, turned two. I can't believe she's already two. Amen, amen. Catherine, and out, Catherine went out with Eliana, and Eliana, Eliana, and my wife, Catherine, picked a gift for a little doll for Emily. They brought it home, and Eliana gave it to Emily. Question, did Emily have to pay for that, yes or no? No, no. so it's free. That's what grace is, right? Free. And that's right, she said, that's right. <laughs> that is right, everyone heard you. <laughs> so the gift was free, right? Did Emily do anything to deserve that gift, that, that special doll that she got from her sister? No. No merit. It was unmerited. It's your birthday, right? So grace is free and it's unmerited. Like, Emily didn't do anything to deserve that. Let me give, <laughs> that's right. You, that's right. Amen too. Amen too. So let me explain it this way. Uh, you know when um, God rescued the Israelites from Egyptian slavery? When he takes them out, crosses the Red Sea, and he gives the Ten Commandments, what does he say to the people? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I saved you from slavery. Question. Did they do anything to earn that? No. Unmerited. Was it free? Yes, it came from the heart of God. Now, it was a costly, costly love from God, but it was free. And it was unmerited. And so what Paul is saying is, like, is saying, look, you Judaizers, you're, you're all about like legalism and merit and no, 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 no. The character of God is grace. That's what he's trying to introduce. Thus, let me write this here. Grace, how can we understand grace? A, I feel like I'm a professor here, teacher. Grace is, can you guys read my handwriting? Uh, free mercy, and we'll call it Q. It's a quality. It's not an equation. I'm just, so, this word, that letter stands for quality. It's a quality of Christ, God of God. He gives us free mercy. 
okay? How else can we understand this word grace? Here we go. Grace is not only a quality, it is an event. What word did I say? An event. Pastor, what are you talking about? Galatians chapter 1 again, now verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who what? Raised him from the dead. So uh, grace is tied to the resurrection of Christ. And check this out, okay? Now go to, now chapter 2, verse 21. Galatians chapter 2, now verse 21. He says, Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God. There it is. In the, in the Greek, it's charis, the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Christ what? Died. He's tying grace to the resurrection. Paul is tying grace to the crucifixion. What's the point? In Paul's mind, the death and resurrection of Christ signaled a new dawn and era of human history. The death and resurrection of Christ ushered in a new era. What word? Era of grace. That had never been seen before. It's like your birthday. Mine's coming up December 9. I can't believe I'm going to be 40 this year. Yes, I am old. I'm no longer a young adult. Yeah, pray for me. It's a new era. Or about, what about those of you who were born early enough to remember Y2K? You know what Y2K is? Let me define it for those of you who were born after 2000. That was, why, that was a time where the whole world got scared about the new millennium that was going to break on us in the year, in year 2000. A new era. So what's Paul saying here? Before the cross, you were performance driven. But since the cross and Christ's resurrection, we don't have to believe and think in those patterns anymore. This is a new era. What word? A new era of freedom. Pastor, explain that. All right, so I'm going to use this example. On January 1, 1863, as the nation approached its third year of bloody war, President Abraham Lincoln, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Have you heard of that? which declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforth, henceforward, shall be free. So January 1, 1863, legally, slaves were made free. A new era for the slaves. And you can imagine. And yes, while slavery and racism still existed, and by the way, it still exists today, while it still existed, at least the government was able to say, legally, they are free. A new era for the slaves, a new era of freedom. So grace is a quality. It is the free mercy that comes from God. But what is grace? It is also a new, what word is that? A new era characterized by freedom, characterized by transformation. And if there was someone, if there was someone who knew about the grace of God, it was Paul the apostle. He was Saul on his way with his performance-driven ways to kill the Christians on his way. And while he was on the road of Damascus, Jesus comes up, blinds him. He experiences the mercy of God. And at that moment, what happens? A new era for him. Grace comes into his life. I am transformed. No longer do I kill the Christians. Now I try to make more Christians. Paul knew about that. The grace of God transformed Paul. And by the way, the grace of God, that, this grace of God isn't just some like historical word. It transformed me. I would have never thought in a billion years that I would be a pastor. Like what? How does that even happen? But for some reason, the Chesed, the mercy, the charis, the mercy of God gripped my heart. Oh, what purpose, love, joy changed me. Free mercy. And I didn't even have to pay for it. In fact, he paid for it with his life. And once I experienced that quality of God's love, it started a new era in my life. And friends, that new era is not just, uh, the word is punctiliar. Do you know what punctiliar means? A point in history. Yes, I can look back to my conversion in 2002 in this city at Prosser High School. August 2002, I'm coming up on 20 years uh, since my new birth experience here in the city of Chicago. Punctiliar. 
but it is a continual experience, a new era that I can have every single day. Pastor, how do I know that? Lamentations chapter 3, 22. Through the Lord's mercies, chesed, by which we get the word grace. Old Testament, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. In other words, I don't implode. Why? Because his compassions, his love for me never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So I can have a continue, I can look back in my experience at a point in time when I became a new, a born again Christian and every single day I can have that same mercy and experience a new era. If that's good news, say hallelujah. All right, so explosive. I I hope you can tell that I'm excited about this because I'm pretty (laughs) excited about this. All right, so what's explosive word number one? Grace. All right, let's keep going. What's number two? Verse, okay, we're going to read verses three through five, and then uh, we'll come back to verse four. You guys ready? Look, it's just five verses, and you can pull out so much just from five verses. Here we go. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present, present evil age, according to the will of our God the Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. What's the next word? What was the first one? Grace, number two, deliver. You know what deliver means? It's translated rescue. You know what rescue is? Rescue was a few months ago when I saw my little girl, Emily, taking a bubble bath with her sister. She slipped back and fell into the water, and I saw her face submerge in the water. You know what rescue is? Her daddy, me, standing, getting off of the seat, and rescuing her out of the water so she wouldn't drown. That's the image I get when I think of rescue, rescue, rescue. Jesus delivers us from drowning. Now, drowning from what? Well, look at the verse, verse 4. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this what? So I'm going to write it here. The present, can you finish that word? Evil. Age. Okay, let's just separate this here. That's your heading right there. <clears throat> the present evil age. What is the present evil age? Good question. Number one. I hope you can read this, okay? Ready? It is, can you guys read my handwriting here? A free for all. Can you guys see that? So how do we define the present evil age according to Paul? First, it was a, um, the present evil age is a free-for-all culture. How do I know this? Look at Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 19. And try to think if you see any connections between 2022 modern-day culture and this culture in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19, verse 19 through 22. You guys ready? He says, Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. He's basically saying sex before marriage, even sex uh, outside the marriage. That's what he's saying. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whoa, 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 whoa. Paul, you're a little too strong there. What are you saying here? You see, Greco-Roman culture, when he was writing this to the, the Galatian churches, they were in the midst of a, a very, a very a free-for-all culture, right? Free-for-all culture, Greco-Roman culture. Now, you might think, oh, those people were atheists. They didn't believe in God. That's not true. They were not purely secular. The, uh, the Greco-Roman mindset and worldview, uh, they had gods, but they had a plethora of them. And many times, their understanding and their worship of their gods was tied to their immorality. And so what Paul is saying is like, look, Jesus delivers us from what? This present evil age that is defined by a free-for-all culture. Now, do you guys think we live in a free-for-all culture? A free-for-all culture, modern culture, 2022, is uh, living without restraint. How do I know that? 
So uh, I looked at the Billboard's top 100, like the hot 100. You guys, ever, you guys ever look at that? Maybe you don't. That's good. But I went on Billboard's hot 100, the top songs that are being played across the radio waves right now and gets millions of hits on YouTube. Number nine, there was a, book, there was a, a song called Bad Habits. I'm not going to mention who sings it. And I do want to say this, that um, I have nothing against the singer. I think he has an amazing voice. What I'm trying to do is just show you what's embedded in our culture, okay? And I didn't even want to put all of the lyrics. I just put some of them. Uh, the singer says this. Now, this is number nine on the top 100. That's being played all over the radio waves. My bad habits lead to wide, wide eyes stare into space, and I know I'll lose control. I'll lose what? I'll lose control of the things that I say. Yeah, I was looking for a way out. Now I can't escape. Nothing happens after two. It's true. It's true. My bad habits lead to you. What's he saying here? I have bad habits, but I want you. And I'm just going to forsake conscience and allow this, these desires within me, these bad habits within me, chase after you. Question. Does that sound like a free-for-all, living without restraint culture? <laughs> What's Paul saying? Christ came to deliver us from the present evil age, which is defined by a free-for-all culture. But you know what? That's not the, that's not the uh, culture that he was really uh, warning us about. You know what he was warning us about? He was warning about, us about this culture. This was the worst. This was even worse for him. Okay, I'm going to put a big word on the screen, and I'm going to define it, okay? Can you guys read this? Fast. Can you read that? Fastidious. Pastor, I didn't come here to go to school. <laughs> okay, look, let me help you define. Let me help you, let me help define this. Fastidious is uh, being very attentive to accuracy and detail. Now it's okay to do that. We have any nurses in the, the group? Okay. Um, you better make sure that you are fastidious when you're injecting someone. <laughs> Do we have any surgeons in the group here? Listen, if you're not fastidious, one little inch is the life of one of your patients. So fastidiousness is okay. Any leaders here, any managers here? We better be precise with our numbers and precise with our vision and our goals, right? So fastidiousness is okay. But fastidi fastidiousness is dangerous as a philosophy of life. Fastidiousness is dangerous as a philosophy of life. What is fastidiousness? Fastidiousness is precision. It is exactness. It is scrupulousness. It is, I will, I will be so exact to the T. So what's Paul doing here? There's a group called Judaizers. These Judaizers are, 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 are um, trying to promote this fastidious philosophy. And Paul, Paul writes the letter to the Galatian church to fight this fastidious way of life. All these opponents were calling themselves Christians. And they were naming the name of Christ and saying, hey, in, in order for you to be a believer and to be accepted by God, you must be fastidious. Follow the law to the T. Become circumcised so you can receive the blessing of Abraham. Ah, uh, friends, just, just in case you think that was only a problem for the Judaizers, we have that same problem too. We think, I must make myself qualified, then I will be accepted by God. We act like some of the Hindus in Bali. We will be accepted by God because we bring food to the gods. So we do something. What do we try to do something to qualify ourselves to be accepted by God? Here are some examples of this. We do all the right religious things. We read the Bible, we pray, we go to church, we witness, we serve as a leader in the church, we give offering. There's nothing wrong with that, but if that becomes your universe, that is a problem according to Paul. We make deals with God. Oh God, please help me. I messed up. I'll make a deal with you. You saved me from this STD. I'll never sin again, trust me. I'll make a deal with you, God. You save me from, from this cancer, from this debilitating sickness. Heal me, and I'll never sin again. Fastidiousness. 
must do something to, to receive your acceptance, oh God. We are fastidious in school and work. And friends, I want to say there is nothing wrong with being and doing our best. In fact, I believe that God expects a good return on his investment. Do you know what, you know what he, uh, he has invested in you and me? Three things. Time, talent, treasure. He gives you the gift of time and asks, will you use my time wisely and for my glory? Will you use your treasure, your money, your assets for my glory? Will you use not just your time, your treasure, but also your talents, the skills that I have given to you? And will you, will you use your skills and actually work on them and, and improve them so that you can bring more glory to my name? I think a fastidiousness is okay, but when my excellence and when my fastidiousness becomes my universe... That's a problem according to Paul. And Paul is saying a free-for-all life does not work. That's what Christ is trying to deliver us from. This present evil age is defined by this, but it's especially defined by a fastidious, legalistic, precision, accurate, exact, scrupulous life. And Paul is saying, no, get that out of here. That's what, the, what Jesus is delivering us from. And you know what the problem is? A free-for-all culture is focused on who? Me. A fastidious culture is focused on who? Me. And so what does Paul do? This text says, Galatians 1.4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. Imagine you were going swimming, you didn't know how to swim. You start flailing your arms because you get you a panic because the waves are too big. Help, help, lifeguard, jumps into the water, breaks through the water, swims as fast as he can to you, and he rescues you from drowning. Question, how much work did you do to have to be rescued? How much work? The only thing you had to do is cry for help. None. It was not your work, your fastidiousness that rescued you. It was your lifeguard that saved you. Hallelujah. You believed and depended on your lifeguard to save you. It was your faith in your lifeguard that saved you. In other words, Paul's saying, look, do not live a free-for-all life. Do not live a fastidious life. Live a life that is characterized, I'm going to write it here, by faith. Are you seeing what Paul's saying? Why? When, because when I have faith, the object of my world and my universe is not me, it is who? It is God. This is the heart of Paul's message. This is, this, is, this is the heart of the gospel. Justification by faith alone, that I am saved, not by what I do, not what I do, but faith in what God does for me. And we would have no Protestant Reformation if, if Paul did not teach that we are justified freely by his grace through this activity called faith. So that's the heart of the Reformation, the heart of our Christian experience. If we're drowning, we can't save ourselves, so we cling by faith. What word did I say? Faith to our, our lifeguard, our Savior, to deliver and rescue us, rescue us from this evil world. So word number one, what's the first word? Grace. What do we get? We get grace. What's the second explosive word? Deliver. That explains why he gives us grace. He gives us grace and peace for the purpose of delivering us from this present evil age, especially this big problem of fastidiousness. And he changes us to believe in him, in Christ by faith, Last word, then we're done. Let's keep going. Verse 4. It's the second word in verse 4, by the way. I love this. You guys ready for it? Who gave himself for our sins. What do you think the, the third word is, friends? <laughs> All right, here we go. So right, what was the first one again? Okay, so grace. Second was deliver. Third word, what is it? Give. What does God give us? Grace. Why? 
to deliver us from what? The present evil age? And how did he do that? <laughs> he gives himself. All right, we know it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. All right. Paul uses this word in the Greek, who gave himself in Galatians. The Greek word is didomi. You know what John uses in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave. Same word, didomi in the Greek. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever is fastidious, that whoever believes in who? In Jesus, would not perish but have everlasting life. So what's the point? Jesus throws himself into the water to save us. I was in the... uh, the beautiful country of Greece. Finishing my last class, uh, I was studying, finishing Greek class in the country of Greece in the city of Athens. It was so amazing. And I remember we went, uh, took a boat to another island to take a break. And we were jumping into the water off a cliff. And I thought, you know, the water was crystal blue. You could see right to the bottom. You could see the rocks on the bottom. It was beautiful, beautiful weather, clear day, sunny day, clear water. You can't beat it. Jumped into the water, had a great time. Several of us decided, hey, let's swim to the buoy. Probably about, I don't know, 70 feet away. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, you know, I, I think I'm a decent swimmer. So I, I started going, and yes, there were waves, so I, I kept going. I kept going, and some of my friends were beating me. I'm not the best, I can swim, but I'm not the best swimmer. And I kept going, I kept going, and I was, ter- was kind of nervous because all of my friends were beating me, but there was, there was someone behind me. I just kept going and going, and finally I made it to the buoy, and I held on to that buoy for my life. Thank you. Now I need to get back. <laughs> so so um, what I did was I started, I started swimming back, 70 feet, right? Get back to the, the cliff. We're good. We'll go home. Piece of cake. The problem was, as I was swimming, the waves were coming, and it was kind of like swimming on a treadmill or running on a treadmill. You know what running on a treadmill? You're you're just running in the same place. And that's exactly what I was experiencing. I'm nervous. I'm terrified. I'm not going anywhere. I keep swimming with all the fastidiousness that I could muster, but I wasn't going anywhere. What was I going to do? Fortunately, one of the, the students there, a friend of mine, this girl, Sarah, who had lifeguard experience, put her arm on my chest and she said, hey, keep going. I said, seriously, keep, all right. <sighs> wasn't going very far, but I was moving this time. Wasn't going very far, I, wasn't, I was moving this time. And it was because of my lifeguard, Sarah, that I made it to, made it to, the, to the shore and I'm alive standing before you today. When you are drowning, Jesus does not, when you are drowning, Jesus delivers. He comes in. He gives himself for you. He throws himself into the water to rescue you from drowning. And question for you, when you are drowning, does Jesus give you an instruction manual? Do you know what this is? Total immersion. I was trying, when I was in seminary, I wanted to, I had these dreams of doing a, um, a full Ironman like five of our members did a few months ago. And so I said, I need to work on my swimming. So I bought this total immersion book <laughs> to learn how to swim. And friends, to, like learning to swim while reading a book is like learning to play basketball re- while reading a book. It doesn't work. <laughs> but I thought, if I have the instruction manual, then I'm going to be able to swim. And this is what we think. Look, when I'm drowning, I just need to follow the instruction manual to the T and be fastidious. My fastidiousness, my perfect form is going to save me. But Jesus says, look, you can't even, you can't save yourself. I will give of myself for you. I will jump into the water to save you. And unlike Sarah, both of us survived that, that, uh, that, that crazy day. Jesus did not survive. And I liken it to this. Imagine you and Jesus on a small boat. And it capsizes between rocks And there's only one space above the water underneath that boat where someone can breathe. And Jesus is there staying afloat. And you're in the water drowning. I can't breathe. I can't swim. I can't breathe. And Jesus 
dips down and he says, I'm going to come in and I'm going to give myself for you. And he raises you up so that you are the only one in that small pocket who can breathe. And he drowns for you. This is exactly what Jesus did. And in no other worldview, you will not find this in Islam. You will not find this in Hinduism. You will not find this in Buddhism. You will not even find it in atheism because atheism is based on people and people don't have this kind of self-giving love. No other worldview compares to Christianity, to the uniqueness of Christ, the one God who becomes man and he gives his life for you and me. Hallelujah. We cannot be delivered if we try to swim harder. Fastidiousness doesn't work when you're drowning. We can only be delivered when we cling by, what word is this everyone? When we cling by faith. Only when I hold on to my lifeguard. It is only when, when I feel my nothingness. Can you guys read my handwriting? Sorry, I just wanna get through this message. It is when I feel my nothingness that I can be rescued. The world says I can save myself by my fastidiousness. I bring my qualifications to the table. When I interviewed here, yes, I have my master's degree. Yes, I've been pastoring for 14 years. I bring my qualifications to the table. I'm so blessed to be working, working here at this church. But when it comes to salvation, these qualifications bring nothing. My fastidiousness, my qualifications bring they, they merit nothing. The gospel says, I can only be saved by faith. I bring nothing to the table. And so I asked that question at the beginning, the one question we're trying to answer. Five verses, three explosive words, one question. What do I bring to God to be accepted by him? The only thing that I bring is my need for a savior. And there's someone here, there's someone here who's in need of a savior this morning. And if that's you, friend, you're tired of a free-for-all life, you're tired of a fastidious philosophy of life, you wanna live by faith and cling to the one, to your life guard, to the only one who can rescue you. It is not when I bring my qualifications to the table, but when I bring my nothingness and my desperate need for a savior. It is only then that Jesus can save me? Is there someone here who he or she, maybe you're watching online, you are feeling your nothingness and your need for a savior. Would you raise your hand with me? Our praise team is gonna come up. Praise team is going to come up. They're going to lead us in this song. No turning back, no turning back. I want Jesus. I don't wanna go back to a free for all living kind of life. I don't want to go back to a fastidious philosophy of life. I wanna live by faith in my Christ who delivered me by giving his life for me, by becoming nothing. So that when I feel my nothingness and I feel my great need for him, he rescues me. Don't wait till tomorrow. You can have the experience of salvation now, not by what you do, but because of what he's done. You do that, you can accept Christ by faith. Someone want that today? I know I do. Praise team, lead us in this song.